uh, preaching for the Bible Institute graduation down there at Grace Bible Church in Titusville. I got a text from Dan. He said, uh, you're interested in preaching Wednesday night? And he said, are you feeling it? So I said, definitely. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. And so I had services down there. They did a special graduation on Saturday for their Bible Institute. And then... Uh, Three services on Sunday, so it was a it was a blessing to be down with Pastor Jeffrey and and some friends down there. But always happy to be back with you guys. So we're going to talk about uh, Abraham's blessings. Um, we're going to look at at the blessings that God gave to Abraham and to the nation of Israel, and then we're going to compare those to just uh, some of the blessings that God has given to the Grace Believer. We're going to be taking a look at those, and we'll do a little comparison. I've got. Um, Cody said, you got your pillow, right? You're all set up? All right, good deal, because I got four pages of notes. We'll just see how many I can get through in, in about 30 minutes. So I know we got to do prayer tonight, and my wife's back there. She'll be giving me the high sign, you know, when it's time to start wrapping it up. She'll give me the, she'll give me the, so I have to kind of teach to this side and teach to this side. I won't teach to the middle, because that's where Jennifer's trying to distract me. But uh, the New Testament does mention Abraham about 74 times in the, uh, in about 70 verses, uh, the New Testament writers describe the blessings received by Abraham or um, from Jehovah. So the Gospels will list Abraham's name in the genealogies. Uh, they also mention the seed of Abraham, usually in the context when Jesus is discussing back and forth with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees claim to be of the seed of Abraham, and he's our father, Abraham. So you'll see his name popping up there. Um, the patriarch's name is also listed uh, oftentimes when God is talking about his performance for the nation of Israel, he'll talk about, I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, who brought up Israel out from the land of Egypt. So when he's listing his accomplishments, Abraham's name will pop up there. So when you do a search, you'll find his name about 74 times uh, in, the, in the New Testament. Um, so this, um, also you'll see Abraham's name mentioned with what he received from God. And this is really what we want to focus on in the New Testament. Abraham received the word of God. He had oaths sworn to him uh, in the form of covenants or promises. And then we see God's interaction with Abram and Sarai when he promised them a son. And he told them, your seed will actually number as the stars in the heavens and the sands of the sea. So he promised to his seed land and blessings, different things. Uh, so... He did this at a time when Abraham was in his 90s uh, and had not had any kids. So it took a great step of faith for Abraham to believe God for these promises. So this was a tremendous singling out and treating Abraham specially. He was marked by God to be the patriarch of a group of people that God was going to have special dealings with for hundreds of years and he's still not done with the nation of Israel. We see that in Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. But God singled them out. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 15. I want you to see one of these um, promises that God gave to Abraham. Very, very interesting here. So he gave them some general promises. I'm, I'm going to give you some land. You're going to have lots of kids. He didn't give them a specific number. But here we have a pretty specific promise given to him here. Let's start reading in verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So we have this covenant that God is making with Abraham at this time. He gives him a very specific set of promises right here. He doesn't just say, you're going to have a kid. He doesn't just say, your kid is going to have lots of kids and grandkids and, and, and there's going to be a lot of people there. He says that. But he says, this group of people I'm going to deal with in a very specific way. I mean, that's, that's a neat blessing. That, that's, that's something awesome that God did for Abraham to show his power. And we actually have God delivering on this promise to the day. We take a look at this, this story later on in the book of Genesis with Jacob. 
and uh, Joseph. So Jacob has his kids, and you've got the favoritism between the favored son from his favorite wife, Rachel, and then you have all these other kids who didn't like Joseph, who was treated as the favorite, and they, you know, dad gave him, of course, the coat of many colors. Martin, you want to answer that for me? Take, thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right. I can't talk right now. Tell him I'm busy. Um, so you have this coat of many colors, this favoritism that, that God showed, um, that uh, Jacob showed to, to Joseph, caused this problem. So what do the brothers do? They take Joseph, and some of them want to kill him, but Reuben intercedes, and he says, oh, just, just throw him in a pit. And so Joseph ends up getting sold to the uh, Ishmaelites and get taken down into this land. Was it an accident which land Joseph got taken to? Well, we see here in the promise that, that this is a group that God wanted to judge. So it was no accident that Joseph got taken down to Egypt because God had this whole thing worked out where Joseph was going to be treated unrighteously. He was going to be lied about. He was going to be thrown into prison. He was going to be raised up out of that prison and given a position of power so that God could use his dream interpretation to be able to provide for his brothers, sisters, and extended family that remained back in Israel. And so Jacob comes down with all of those people after Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, after all that happens. So this is a very specific promise, and God carried out in a very specific way. So pretty neat blessing God gave to Abraham, right? So I mean, that, that's just, that's pretty incredible right there. So Abraham received all of these blessings, as well as some physical blessings, like wealth and earthly power. But during his life, he had to move several times because of famine, and he settled into this land and had his family. But actually, we see that Abraham was not able to receive all of his blessings in his lifetime. In fact, he wasn't even able to receive all of the blessings that he was promised um, in several generations. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to see something very clear here. Hebrews chapter 11. Of course, all woven through Scripture is God's dealings with the nation of Israel and how He's um, revealing Himself faithful to them, delivering them, teaching them not to trust in their righteousness, not to have faith in their own righteousness, a righteousness which could be out from the law, but um, to believe in God's righteousness and to trust in God's righteousness. He keeps dealing with them all throughout. So we see in this chapter here, Hebrews chapter 11, demonstration of faith. Abraham, of course, is listed here. Um, starts in verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we see Sarah... Um, having um, this promise to her with this child when she was past age. We read, skip down to verse uh, 13. Actually, let's read verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So God kept his promise with, um, by asking of when he asked Abram to look up into the sky and see all the stars. Um, we see uh, that fulfillment. But verse 13, we see these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Let's skip down all the way to the end of the chapter to verse 39 and 40. Um, we had a lot more mentioned in that time period. But we see these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Basically, that apart from us, they should not be complete. Basically, without us being around, and the author of Hebrews is talking about the grace believer who was given something better. And apart from the grace believer getting what he was promised, the nation of Israel was not going to be complete. They were not going to be given the complete promise yet. So here we have this revelation. I believe it was the Apostle Paul um, basically saying God's dealing with Israel, but he's going to stop dealing with Israel 
then he's going to give something better to this group of people right here. This group of people called grace believers, the church, the body of Christ. And when he's finished with them, then he will make Israel complete. So we see that right here. So the provision of God to the grace believer is described here as something better, some better thing for us. Now, we have some blessings that are kind of similar to the blessings that Abraham received. Let's talk about some of the similarities. Um, Let's go to Romans chapter 4. We're actually compared in a way to Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Paul is laying out his treatise of justification and how it's possible for righteousness to be imputed to someone's account. And he's teaching this principle of justification. So he says in verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Now here's a quote from Genesis chapter 12. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. We actually see um, this. Actually, actually, this might be a quote from Genesis 15. When we see um, Abraham um, believing the promise that God made him. So we skip down, um, and we see uh, verse 9. It says, Cometh this blessedness then upon circumcision only, or upon uncircumcision? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Basically talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham. And he said, when God imputed righteousness to Abraham's account, had the sign of circumcision even been given him yet? And it hadn't. This was a sign that came upon Abraham, God gave to Abraham later on in life. So what Paul is telling people here is it wasn't Abraham keeping the sign, the covenant of circumcision that enabled him to get the righteousness imputed. It was his faith. It was just his faith alone apart from his works. So in this way, we are similar. So verse 13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham to accede through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So he didn't have to do anything in order to earn this favor from God. And the Apostle Paul basically brings us right in here. And he says, we're similar to Abraham in this way. He says, um, well, we're already running out of time. But basically, he he lumps us in with Abraham here. He says, uh, verse 23, says, not... Now it was not written for this sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So we also. So there's a similarity here with Abraham. We were given this same blessing. Now Romans lays out this case. If we were to spend some time and go to Galatians chapter 3, we would see another comparison to Abraham, how the gospel was given to Abraham. So it was on the basis, again, of faith, not of works. Galatians 3.9 says that the believer is blessed with faithful Abraham. But the blessings of the believer today greatly surpass those that were given to Abraham. It's very important that you understand the blessings that you've been given. In order to be able to live the life that you need to live, you need to understand distinction. Go ahead, you can mark that one down. You need to understand distinction between the blessings that God gave to Abraham and the blessings that God has given to you. If you don't understand the distinction, when you have a problem, you may seek to solve it the same way Abraham solved his problem. Uh, I know a lot of people, when they struggle, they go and look uh, through the Psalms. And it's a great way to worship God through the Psalms. But if you look to solve your spiritual problems the way that David solved his spiritual problems, you're going to be very melancholy. You're going to be very emotional. And you're not going to be able to get much victory because David didn't have the same blessings that you have. The blessings that you have are greater than the blessings that David was given. So again, the Psalms are a great way to worship God. Go through the Psalms and see what God says about himself. Look at his loving kindness. Look at his mercy. And you can look at all those things. But don't neglect what you've been given. Don't neglect the things that make you special. If you just take a look at how God blessed those men in the Old Testament and you stop there, 
you're going to miss all the extra that God has given to you. So, again, it's been described as something better. The blessings of the believer today greatly surpass those given to Abraham. We have been placed in Christ. This is a wondrous thing. It's accompanied by a tremendous list of blessings. We get everything. So I'm going to stop here and tell you a story. It was written by Miles McKee. It's called Every Blessing is in Christ. Every so often I come across an excellent illustration of certain aspects of gospel truth. The following is one of them. Some years ago, an extremely wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare works of art. Their collection was legendary. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war. Tragically, he was mortally wounded in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there came a knock on the door. A young man stood there with a large package in his hands. He said, Sir, you don't know me, but I am the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for art. The young man held out this package. I know this isn't much. I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package. It was a portrait of his son painted by the young man. He stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father was so drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him from the picture. Oh, no, sir. I could never repay what your son did for me. It is a gift. The father hung the portrait over the mantle. Every time visitors came into his home, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any of the other works that he had collected. The man died a few months later, and there was a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered, excited over seeing the great paintings and having an opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with this picture of the sun. Who will bid for this picture? Well, there was silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, We want to see the famous paintings. Skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will somebody bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100? $200? Another voice angrily called out, We didn't come to see this painting. We want to see the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts, the Picassos. Get on with the bids. But still the auctioneer continued. The sun, the sun, who will take the sun? Finally, a small voice from the very back of the room cried out. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give you $10 for the painting. Now, being a poor man, it was all he could afford. The auctioneer picked up the bid. We have $10. Who will bid $20? Give it to him for $10. Let's see the masters. The crowd was becoming very angry. They didn't want the picture of the sun. They wanted the most worthy investments for their collection. The auctioneer pounded the gavel, going once, going twice, sold for $10. A man sitting on the second row shouted, Now let's get on with the collection. Well, the auctioneer laid down his gavel. The auction is over. What about the paintings? I'm very sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until this time. Only <coughs> the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the paintings. The person who took the sun gets everything. This is exactly what happened to the believer today. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 makes this explicit. It says that if we get the Son, we get everything. Here's what the verse says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When we receive the Son, we get everything and the best of all. We don't even have to pay the $10. All is given freely, graciously, and abundantly, and that's the gospel truth. So again, the story there written by Miles McKee. So Ephesians tells us that we have been given all spiritual blessings in Christ. These blessings have future implications, but they also have present benefits. If we were to look over at 2 Peter chapter 1, we would see that divine power has been given to the believer in Christ. This is possible because of the capability of an experiential knowledge of Christ. 
So Abraham knew the word, right? What's it, what is it said about Abraham? Abraham is the friend of God, right? We know Abraham is the friend of God. God said, I cannot do to Sodom and Gomorrah what I'm going to do without talking to my friend. I have to talk to my friend. But Abraham was not allowed to have this experiential knowledge of the Son that Peter talks about. This knowledge leads to exceeding great and precious promises. Again, we're out of time. But if you want to take a look at, at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, you see that So Abraham was given promises, and you are given promises. The Bible calls your promises exceeding great and precious. So it describes those even better. This promise was never made to Abraham. The promise of being able to be a partaker of the divine nature. This is a promise. Um, You can understand the mind of God, Philippians chapter 2. We were going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You can have the mind of God. We were going to go to Philippians chapter 3. You can have the fellowship of His sufferings and the power of His resurrection. This power can be felt in different ways according to Scripture. I do want you to turn to this passage, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This is one of my favorite verses um, from the book of Colossians. And we actually see... We actually see some pretty important stuff here. Um, there's actually three different Greek words used um, for the word strong in this passage. Um, and they each have distinct meanings. So Colossians 1 verse 11, "...strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness." So we actually have to, we have to back up because this comes from what we talked about back in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. These are the benefits that we get from having this experiential knowledge of Christ. As you get to know God better and in an experiential way, there's benefits that come to you from that. So, verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. It's one of the benefits. Fruitfulness and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is that gnosko knowledge, the experiential knowledge of getting to know God getting to know the Son of God. And then we go to our power verse. Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness. And it leads to thankful heart, deliverance from the powers of darkness in verse 13, and then redemption and forgiveness in verse 14. Just some of the other blessings that we have that make us distinct. But let's take a look at those three words. We have, first of all, this word uh, strengthened. Now this is dynamo. Um, it means to make strong or to confirm or to enable. So we are enabled because of this experiential knowledge of God. There's a benefit to pursuing getting to know God better. And we are strengthened with all might. Here's our second word. This is dunamis, a little bit different than dynamo. Um, This is actually more focused on ability or force. There's a force of power here. And then we actually have strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. This word power is kratos. It means vigor, dominance, mighty with great power. So we have three different power words here just wrapped up in this same verse. And these are things that are available. You ever feel weak? You feel like um, you've kind of been hit in the gut and you can't get up? You kind of feel like you're dragging, you've got fatigue, but you know there's more than you need to do? You need to understand that this is something that you've been given. This is something that that God has made available to the believer. Well, that's really all the time we have tonight. I have another another two and a half pages. um, But we are going to stop. I do have a list of some things that, um, who am I in Christ? What do I have in Christ? What can I do in Christ? And there's a list basically of, we weren't going to look at all these verses. I was going to read these lists. But we actually basically have a list here of, of about 30 things that separate us, things that are made available to us, things that um, we can use to describe ourselves because God describes us that way because of the fact that we've been placed in the sun. So this is something that you should think about reflectively throughout your day. It's part of the armor. It's going to be how you uh, protect against the darts of the devil. Uh, Anxiety, uh, doubt, discouragement, these are all attacks from Satan. But understanding who you are in Christ 
thinking about it reflectively throughout the day, removing yourself to the third heaven, seating yourself in the heavenlies mentally, seeing yourself as the Father sees you, gives you stability, rooted and ground um, in Him. Rooted and grounded in Him. So it gives you, so if you feel like your life's going like this and you just don't know what's coming around the next corner, remove yourself to the third heaven. Con- conceive of yourself, see yourself the way their Father sees you, and you won't worry about the circumstances of this life. You won't be blown about like children with every wind and doctrine. You'll be able to be grounded and you'll be able to, kept in, be, able to be kept in Christ. So see yourself the way the Father sees you. So um, we're going to go ahead and close. Um, and uh, we'll take some prayer requests. Let's pray. Father, we love